G'day, welcome everyone to yet another adventure in Kev's workshop. My workbench at the moment is still a bit of a mess. I've only just re finished recently the New South Wales 620, 720 class diesel rail cars. These are a, these are a N scale set. Now the 600 class, or 620s I should say, is a power car. 720 is a matching trailer. Now these ever only ever ran as a uh, two car set. Now there is a four car set that's also um, brought out, which is the 900. And the uh, 900 series were classed as Deb sets. There were some intermediate cars making a three car set. So that was for the main north of New South Wales, where the train split off at Werris Creek to Armadale. So um, that's the only differences really. But this is a Peter Borman workshop model. It's a kit that you've got to assemble. And um, you've got to supply a Tomix TMO4 chassis to power this. I'll introduce the reason why I'm showing this in a moment. But here is a 3D printed model of an NR class in N scale. Done by my good mate John Rumming. So if you go on the Kev's Workshop website, you go on the links page, right near the top of the, of the links page, you'll see uh, modelling by John Rumming. <clears throat> That's one of his 3D printed body shells. And the last week you know, that I've been working on this, it's come from just a 3D body, body shell, it's been cleaned up, painted and decaled. And even though we're near the end of September 2019 at the time of the video, it's only taken me roughly a week by between the time the paint job is dried and um, other parts have been cleaned up and painted and, and as you can see I've got a microtrains coupling at the front but to haul my Indian Pacific set which I've got an end scale I need a repeato. So the only thing is with John's model I've had to add on the rear handrail but it's no biggie certainly for me but um, this is nearing completion. What I have got, and I'll come down here to, to illustrate it, if this camera can hold focus. These four panels here, when I finish painting them, it'll actually be these decals that go on, and decals that read Indian Pacific. So there's a pair of these for the left, a pair of them for the right hand side, the loco. So I've had to make four of these pieces of plastic. So they're probably, I don't know, half mil thick plastic pieces. So um, half mil, or was it five thou, whatever the dickens it is. But they're going to be glued up here on the handrail, right near the eagle. Australian Wedgetail Eagle. Now, back in 2012, out of this very workshop, someone that I know broke in and stole my HO scale version. If I bring this piece of paper on up here, there's my HO scale version that was done by Austrains. So you can see up here where the words in Pacific are to, meant to be. And I've, this, this particular logo, I have actually been in the cab of it in Perth Station and at Sydney Station, both stations which should be either side of the country. So you'll find this in my photo gallery page in the HO scale pages. So that, that one there. There's the reverse end of it, and you can see where the handrail sits. There's another Indian Pacific logo on the back. So really all I need to do with the N-scale model is this fancy yellow and blue striping at the bottom, and the Indian Pacific decal on the back. It says NR25 up here. It's a bit hard to see. But yeah, you see here where the Indian Pacific badges go. So they're actually mounted on the handrails. So, if we come back to here, and then we bring this a bit like this, you can see the HO, or the photo of the HO, and the actual N scale NR class. Number 25, when it's first put together, like a lot of them, all the NRs were basically originally grey and orange when they first came out, and then they went into varying colour schemes not long after. So basically, that NR, 
with these four little um, name boards, you might call them. And there's the, the name tags that go on it. So if I just move these around, you can see how, hopefully, how the, um, the, the name boards will have their names put onto them later. But I've got to wait for this paint to finish uh, drying before I can even worry about putting the decals on. There are another pair of these decals which me mate John supplied as well. So there's a pair for the left and a pair for the right. Henceforth, four name boards. Now, in making these little panels up, to make sure the ends are square, <coughs> sorry, are square. Many years ago, my dad bought me this little mini engineer's square. So, you get this from any engineering place, and some hardwares will actually sell them to you. This one here says conforms to the um, standards for squareness. So, yeah, never mind. But this is a very handy tool to have, especially when you're cutting things and needing to put it at 90 degree ends. So, what I'm wanting to introduce you in this video is my squaring board. Now, simple block of wood, it's about 20mm square, thereabouts. So, all I've done for a handle, I've rounded the corners off at one end. I've made the handle, this is all out of scraps, so there's nothing fancy about it. This base is just another piece of plywood. So it's, it's about 12mm, I think, plywood, something like that, 12 16 mil, And again, some more of this 20mm wood at the end. All this was just off-cut scraps lying around. Now, I've got here left-hand corners. Oops, I'll move the camera over to here. Yep, left-hand corner. And up the other end, the right-hand corner. And the reason being, as I move this handle, you see here, there's my original hole, which I end up with two holes and that stuff things up. So I've, I've drilled two new holes and put some new nails th through my handle. And what I've done with the underneath, I've actually filed them a little bit smaller in diameter than the rest of the nail. But I've only done that once I put these nails through. So that's drilled using my drill press. You see my original hole here, which is no longer going to be used. And as you can see, this bit of board is square, on oh, sorry, out of square at this end. So you can see the two stuff up holes, which kept throwing me out. So by putting the two newer holes, all I need to do is locate these two holes and those two pegs. Knock it down, and I can actually then work a corner on my left hand side. Alternatively, if I flip this over, just put my hands here. Alright, that's better. So you can see, push this into here, come on, in you get. Alright, and this one, it's a very firm fit. Right, if I push that down, it's now in place. And just to sh show it is square. So my, my squaring board is designed for making things like locomotive tenders. Now if you're doing card kits and you want to glue houses together, any sort of building. Plus it also is square this way as well. So you can work into a corner. For example, instead of using some plastic, I've just cut some pieces of cardboard just to illustrate. If you want to put a cardboard kit together, once you've got the cardboard cut nicely and squarely, you can then imagine building a corner piece. So rather than going gluing this, it's just for illustration purposes. But I have built many a tender using this method. So um, depending on how you want to do the join work, if you put this as your end, that is as a side. The size of this cardboard is neither here nor there. Because you've got, got a tender, we'll say as long as that, 
that's the length of your tender or your width could be um, your width could be as wide as that but if you want to make sure when you're building your locomotive or tender or your house or whatever it is you're building you want to make sure that you've got everything that you need where you need it so by having what's called a butt joint I like my butt, it's just some joint, it's got a crack in the middle of it but anyway, <laughs> jokes aside it depends which way you want that joint to face if you want to have a 45 degree angle then you chuck a 45 degree angle on your piece of plastic or whatever it is you're using and then you end up with a mitre joint but if you make the back of your tender or whatever to the overall width then your side pieces can be fractions shorter to account for the thickness of the plastic or whatever you're using at this end so in theory you can make in this case a right handed corner or you can go up to this end and do a left handed corner but basically you would have the block of wood sitting here at 90 degrees which uh, yeah, if I do this just may be me so this simulates the handle at this end instead well you'd build into this corner and you'd do the opposite side now when it comes back to this area if you're building say a, a water tank and those old steel rectangular type jobs that we use in country New South Wales there's a variety of different ways you can do the recess same as a, a locomotive tender if that was to be your top piece imagine this is upside down in the jig what you'd want to do is um, just using this other piece of cardboard just for an example yeah, I've just got to grab something to move the cardboard with because I've got no grip on my fingers right if say for example I want to do a recessed top let's get this into place so I'm leaving a bit of a gap, it makes no real difference that, that piece of cardboard is going to act as a spacer and then by the time I push this into place so now this piece of cardboard here, which I'll just use this as an example that piece there acts as a spacer alright, so with that acting as your spacer That'll give you thickness from the very top to the top of your deck. Or, you know, this is, say for example, this is the back of the tender, and that's where the water area is going to be, and you, your coal area is going to be up front, but you need a recessed back end. This is the sort of thing you need to do is put a spacer to the required thickness, and then if you look down in here, you'll see that this has a recess in. So that recess means you can then run a beta glue along there and along there and imagineering, or imagining I should say, beta glue along this side with the other piece in place. So for example, if we had the other piece of plastic over here and that's all glued together, that now gives you the box formation that you need. But if you're going to do this in sections, you're going to have the back wall or front wall of your tender or water tower or whatever it is you're making you have your one side wall and then your tank top so either way this is how I've come up with making a squaring jig so at least this way I can then look at it and go right it's at 90 degrees at this angle it's at 90 degrees that angle and also at this angle now if you look at any of my models on my website if you look at um, so the New South Wales D53 D54 class the tender was built like that my original scratch built New South Wales C36 tender was built the same way and the Victorian Railways S class which I completed around mid uh, 2019 done the same way so there's many many places where this application works in fantastic so you, all you got to do whether you're using cardboard 
plastic, uh, whatever, to make up any scratch building stuff. If you need to do a recess, work out what sort of recess you need, put in the required thickness, and then when you run your bead of glue around the inside, even up through the guts of all this, at least you know that all three surfaces will be glued. So even if you're going to do a bit of soldering with brass, you want to make sure you get all angles correct. Then you can run your bead of solder and your soldering iron, and you can make sure it's all locked in tight, 90 degrees in every particular angle. So yeah, there you go. I know it's only a bit of a short video on this particular item. But this is something I came up with many years ago for doing HO and N scale. Now for those of you wondering what size to make it, remembering this is all nothing but scrap. I'll just get me rule out here. Now reading the measurements upside down, it's around 20 centimetres. There you go. Oops. It's lined up again. It doesn't have to be accurate. It's about 19 and a half to 20 centimetres long, or 200 mil thereabouts. So, th 30 centimetre rule. Generally, that's 305 mil is one foot. So, um, for those working imperial. So, yeah, if, if your 100 mil is four inch, you're looking at about eight inches worth thereabouts. So, um, certainly for length, it can be whatever length you want, and generally speaking, it can be any width you want, but this particular one that I've made up many years ago is around 4 inches or uh, 100 mil from edge to edge. It doesn't have to be accurate, but whatever scraps you've got, they're dead easy to make. It only take you maybe a couple of hours, depending. If you're really good at, at your woodwork and your metal work and all that, you should have no dramas at all. So basically, I'll just move some of this other garbage out of the way. It's from over here, see? Got AFX slot car chassis as well. So I'll do a lot of service and repair on, on these sort of cars. This one's a uh, Super G Plus tell by the elongated magnets at the back. And another way of telling is the Super G Plus is the back end of the chassis is sort of rounded rather than squared off. And they have these little body mounts. Plus on top of that, with Super G Plus you can change the bell housing at the front, get slow, medium or super fast <laughs> motor movements depending on, on the positioning. So that's Super G Plus. Oh my goodness, everything gets picked up by magnets. There's another Super G Plus. A bit different. So, for those into slot car racing, it might not have anything to do with my squaring board, but hey, they're here in, in the video shots. This is a turbo chassis. You see what I mean about the back end being squared off? How's that? You can see a bit better and a bit clearer now. That's a turbo chassis. Another way of telling it's a turbo, they usually put the bathurst type rims on. And when you look underneath the back end, see the square magnets on it? When you look at it from above, underneath that retaining clip, it's like a giant horseshoe section, but square. So they're the, the traction magnets that give it grip on, on the racetrack. So if we flip these over, but now. Yeah. See the difference between the Turbo and Super G Plus. So you can see how one's rounded and one's squared off. Turbo's on your left, Super G Plus is on the right. You can see the difference in magnets as well. But technically, three pole motors, same sort of skid arrangement. This, this one here is fitted up with lighting, that one isn't. But certainly, I have made a slot car. Or actually, sock car body. There's actually Roscoe McLashan's Aussie Invader 2 jet car. Now, funny thing is, I built that on this. You might think, wow, how? Well, when you think the body's got two sides, it's 
basically got a, a top deck. So all, all the whole car was built using this. Same method as I do for my model railways. So anyone wants to look up Roscoe McLashen is on the uh, internet, or wants to look up Aussie Invader 2 jet car, you'll find photos on there. You can go to the Aussie Invader website. So if you want to look, look, look that up, it'll give you a lot more information than I can give you right here at the moment. So yeah, definitely, you know, I, I went and saw Roscoe McLashen many, many years ago. Told him what I wanted to do as far as building a model of his car. He says to me, go for your life. So I measured it, done all the drawings, everything. Made the Moscow model. And you'll find that on my other projects page of my Kev's Workshop website. So despite looking at this board thinking, well, you can only do it for model railways. Well, seriously, you can do it with model cars as well. But that's besides the point. Now something else I'm getting out for you. This is the beginnings of, of a loco body. It was a Japanese loco body. You see I've actually gone to the trouble of extending it. Well this is where the squaring board comes back into use. Apart from making sure when you glue the, the ends in place, as you can see there, that the ends are square. When you come to cutting a body and lengthening it, like I've done, by the time you put that into there, there is a gap down the side. But I wouldn't stress too much about that because it's done on purpose. But, certainly if I turn this upside down try to get the lighting a bit better for you. You see how it's used to straighten a, a cut, where you've got to cut and shut, or cut and lengthen. So this here will keep it in a straight line. So, even though this body is something I started many years ago, up here, I'll just reach over and grab this and bring this down for you. That's a Termix TM04 chassis. Now, whichever way I, I look at it, and there's a reason for bringing this down, because it does relate to this particular board. Now, even though you've got pickups front and rear, you see there the pickups. What I've had to do to one of these recently, it's only, well, we're in September 2019 at the time of this video. I shall show you, because here's the end result. Now, if I take the trailer car, which I purposely left disconnected, I bring you down the body and the chassis of the power car. This power car uses one of those chassis. And you might think, how? It's a lot different in length. Well, there's the underneath of it. So, realistically speaking, i lay that like that. There's your front bogey. I've had to cut and lengthen this chassis. Now, thankfully, Peter Borman gives the infill. So, I'll get myself a pointer. Come on down. You have to cut the chassis up here. And by cutting it up here, you are left with all this. There's the original section there. I'll come down to here. There's the original section which you see on this chassis. But up in here, by the time you get rid of all the, the raised lettering, by the time you cut this chassis up about here somewhere, that's where the chassis comes to. So this from here to here is the cast fill in piece. It's like a horseshoe comes around the original motor gearbox arrangement. So this infill piece joins that section to this section. So see if I can do this without dropping my camera and you'll be able to see exactly as to how the squaring board was used. Now if I can do this one handed I'll be happy. Now, it's probably urethane body so, um, oh, come on, you come. Just bear with me while I get frustrated on this. Probably make a few choice wor uh, words. <laughs> Rather not be making. Probably not the camera flying, who knows. So, uh, just a bit of a, a wedge fit. Alright. Bear with me a sec. 
Should have brought the camera tripod out and made life a hell of a lot easier, but couldn't be bothered tonight. So, you can see the back end, now I've just pulled this out. Now, one thing Peter Borman says in his instructions, when you come to cutting and lengthening, he just does say in his instructions, this back edge needs to be cut off. Well, if I set this thing up correctly, that's how much you've got to cut off. So when you look at that, you can see how much has to be removed. I've gone down halfway through the holes, but these were both TMO4 chassis. So by cutting off this back section, if I slide this back, you can now see how much longer I've had to extend it. Bit of a difference, eh? Now when you look at this, they're the original strips. On the, on the original unlengthened chassis. What Peter suggests in his instructions is to solder wires to these tabs, then solder them to the bogey tops. He says don't cut these strips. But me, being me, I prefer to cut the strip, that way I've got the original pickups at the front as needed. And what I've done in here, you see all this extra plastic, I've actually made up a brand new retainer and a chassis strengthener which runs through here. That'll ensure if, that if the glue should for any reason let go in, on one part or the other, there's some sort of strength left. Peter Bullman also includes the wire for the kit. So yes, basically by soldering in underneath and the, the motor pickups are sitting on top. So from, from the motor, it comes down and sits on top of the solder. See, see this one a little clearer. That's directly from the motor. Underneath that is the other phosphorus strip, which you can see comes out here at the back next to the drive shaft. I've painted the sides of the lead weight in black. As you can see, this one isn't. That's stock standard. This is modified. So, at least with this, both motors are the same. Silky, gorgeous running motors, and no flywheel. Jeez, oh, I tell you, if Tomix can re release these chassis, I'll be so stoked. There's a whole series of chassis you can get TM04s, sorry, yeah, 02s, 03s, 04s, 05s, and 06s, all made by Tomix. And the 05s and 06s are a lot longer and dual driven, there's gear towers to both ends. Now, you might wonder how all this works in with the squaring board. When I come to cutting the chassis, I have to square it off with the engineer square. Try to get it as square, squarely up as I possibly could. But, when I come to gluing both ends, I need a straight edge. So, without all the gear on board, no moto, no anything, just the raw chassis. I had a straight edge to line it with. And then I could double check it through here and say, hey look, that is in a straight line. Why do I need the edges in a straight line? Because when the body shell comes along here, it won't go on if the chassis has got a banana bend to it. So let's look at the body shell for a start. That's really all it is. Right, you've got it. an itch brass cow catch at the front. You've got itch brass horns on the roof. You've got itch brass fitting to put at the back for your carriage connections. So you've got to put that little bit of brass in. So that's easily enough done and trued up with the engineer square. But if you look at how nice and straight the sides are, they're fairly darn straight. And I must admit, he's done a bloody good job of, of producing the kit. So, to get this in back into place, and what I'll also show you too before I forget, get this in front of the camera. So, I've rounded the front. 
that was done on purpose. These instructions show cut it flat like I've done to this end. But by doing the rounded at the front, at least that way, it fits the body shape. It does it perfectly too. But it's a bit of Dremel work and hand filing combined. But to have this give power through to here, directly through to the motor, bloody yeah, awesome. So you can see the flywheel sits inside. So the flywheel does hide nicely inside that lead weight. But when it's all put together, you don't know about it. So the idea of using my squaring board is for this purpose. Once that, actually I should drop the front end in first. Back end's got all the weight to it. But once I can pop that in place, at this way, having a straighter edge, I can then say, right, there you go. One chassis sits perfectly in place. All I've got to do then is make sure it comes in and clips down properly as supposed to do. Then when I put this up on my track, so I'm trying to line both hands together. When that sits together, you've got a 620 class rail car. And see how nice and well hidden now the motor looks and the lead weight. There's a drawbar connection between it which I haven't connected just yet. But what I've done, even though Peter's instructions show it as being both pins sitting up from underneath, I'll put the, the tail car one facing down. That, that way I can separate the two units. This is a 720 class tail car and its chassis that is under here uh, is a urethane chassis as well but to stop this from being in the wrong position and that being in the wrong position I've actually extended the chassis so that was a lot easier to do because I've added to both ends whereas this one I've added to the middle so when Peter's done the kit he squared off both ends of the chassis to the tail car so I thought right I'm going to modify it and make it a lot better now the funny thing is we'll look at this front window here it's been painted out and if we come up to the front here you'll notice this is also painted out because in full size that's our luggage compartment area now there's different configurations for these there's a suburban setup out of suburban it's set up and country set up. So up the front here you probably get the, the two windows painted out for large, larger luggage storage. And others, they cut right back here to the engine grills and all the front half is nothing but um, luggage area. Up here becomes passenger. Whereas here you've got the toilet windows. Now these were set, set up from original in real life with toilets. And they're diagonally opposite, and they separate one compartment to the next. But there's a corridor all the way through from end to end. So you can literally walk from this end, through the train, through the doorway. There's a vestibule to go in there, and hopefully I'll be able to show you a video on how to make vestibules later. And you walk all the way through to here, and you're done. And if you're a real rail enthusiast, you can get up through here and talk to the driver. But it depends on the driver. These are only in preservation now, so up until the 1980s these used to be seen all over the New South Wales system. But to do this chassis, it was done on my squaring board. So there you go, this, this is one of many uses for the squaring board. If I was to take that and change the writing and make it swearing, oh man I could swear to the heart's content. But, <laughs> I'm not allowed to do that on YouTube, I suppose. So, that is one of um, many tools that I use here in my workshop. Certainly when I'm putting together kits, and I'm scratch building or kit bashing. So basically, if I put this up here, put that back onto there, and this is going to be a 
makeshift loco of some description. Yeah, we've got all sorts of rubbish up here. There's a German 282 waiting to either be used for spare parts or something. Using bits of balsa wood. This is just, just a way of keeping the wheels together. That will eventually be done properly, of course, with um, proper chassis sides. As you can see, that'll become a 460. It's planned to be a um, New South Wales C35 class. And up in front of it, if I move this pommy body out the way, this many years ago I scratch built a New South Wales C36, and that went walkabouts back in 2012. Well, there's the beginnings of another New South Wales C36. The driving wheels for both engines are the old K's brand, or KS brand. A couple of Lima New South Wales 44 class wheels for the leading pony truck. It's a 460. And these are the old, um, for memory, I think these were Roundhouse brand bogies. Could be incorrect. But they're clo <coughs> close enough for New South Wales C36 tender. So when I build myself a new C36 class, it'll be done on the squaring board, as my first one was. So that'll be the bogey, so I'm reserving aside for that. Again, there's a KS brand, or K's brand, driving wheels. And then the leading wheels, I've got some Lima plastic wheels there for the time being. But they'll probably, I'll probably end up putting uh, metal wheels in its place by the time I built the kit. Well, I scratch build this particular loco. I guess give you an idea, 19.2 degrees Celsius, quarter past eight at night. <laughs> it does get kind of cold in here. There's the SIR 38. Yeah, so some of, the, some of the stuff I've got in here. There's the New South Wales C36, 3642. It's on a calendar, or remains of a calendar. And if I come down here just quickly, there's my original C36 class, which is also 3642. That's one I've done many years ago. It's a long story as to why it's never been completed. Thanks to somebody that was supposed to help me install the motor, nicked off with the bloody motor, sent me back a uh, partly done loco. All you had to do is install the motor for me in the drive system, I would have been happy. But that's the New South Wales C36. Luckily I've still got the N-scale one, but the HO scale uh, ones I had, one was a DJH kit, that was stolen. Scratch built version, stolen. So I'd be lucky to ever see it again. This tender was actually built on the same squaring board we just looked at. The cab was also done on the same squaring board. So you can see where the purpose of using a squaring board comes in. Providing I've got the verticals and everything else at 90 degrees, it helps for assembly. If I just come around this way, you can sort of see some of the detail. So I'm going to build another one of these now, an HO scale, some of the next 12 months, hopefully, all going well. In this background here, there's a card. Let's see if I can move this out of the way a bit. Oops, let me drop the camera. New South Wales D53, hauling freight. That's an inspiration for the D53 class pro project that I've completed. Might as well nick off with the card out, out of the way. Don't need there. There's a German loco. A6O diesel hydraulic Arnold job. So that was to be another project, New South Wales 70. There's my 30 class, C30T, tender version. That tender was also built just prior to me doing the um, squaring jig. So um, it'll give you an idea. Yeah, it's taken a bit of a knocking around and all that. So. It's another project that's never really finished, but who knows, one day it might happen. So, this is what remains of a 60 class that I started years ago. Sorry about jiggling this all around, but... Yeah. Let's come to the rear coal bunker. One day I will get all this cleaned up and get the enthusiasm back to work on the rest of it. But let's look at it here. See how that works in? Is this way I can be certain when I come to gluing it together, at least I know it'll be square.
So that's a rear coal bunker for the Audi 60. And it is in in scale. And because up here you always get oh, no, so many bangs and knocks and crashes, everything's always falling. So that that will eventually become a New South Wales 8060 when I get the motivation to get stuck back into it. But I'm always doing stuff for other people first, and then in between times I'm doing my own work as well. For those who are not familiar with our D60, I'll come up through here. There's a New South Wales AD60 on the Hawkesbury River Ridge, southbound towards Sydney. So that's what an AD60 class Garrett looks like for those who are un unfamiliar. That's an original built format, not the modified format. And they were pre pre predominantly more so used for uh, freight services. So that there's what I'm trying to build it in scale. And if we come down through here, there's a, the beginnings of an in scale model. The wall is sitting incorrectly, <laughs> but yeah, you've got to remember it's only just sitting there. So every time I bang and thump, using hammering or whatever, everything moves and falls, so it's just thrown back together again. But still, there's so many things you can do with a squaring board. Just got to remember this handle here can go to the opposite side and you can work into this corner or you put the handle back over here and work into this corner. Another project I used this board on was when I was putting together some Pico kit wagons. So um, with that I was able to square up the chassis and glue everything properly and it's all come up square. Okay. I've just take, taken a short break in between camera shots to get this out for you. It was a locomotive made by Mahano quite some time ago. Let's bring this one up so you can see it. Mahano. Now this has nothing else on the front or anything, but if we look at this on the back, oops, let me drop the box here. There is a Cape, um, Pacific streamlined. That's perhaps the loco to use for the project I'm about to show you. These are some of the other Mahano steam engines. If you look at them, that's basically what I started with for the project you're about to see. Now, it made its first appearance on my Wombat Flats layout at the Australian Model Railway Association's double -way branch, that is, exhibition for 2019. And just in brief, there's the 482 mountain version with the Vanderbilt tender. But if you can imagine this locomotive being completely nothing but black rather than just coloured, when you see what I've done with it, you would not believe your eyes. Now, just quickly squeeze across over to here. So, if you can get any of these Mahano engines, they were never really the best, but hey, they did the job, and these trams. They ran, oh man, like you would not believe, if you got a good pair, they just ran till bloody cows come home, if you can find the damn cows. They, they're just like, <laughs> non-stopping them buggers until the wheels are dirty. However, if I move the box and put it down to one side, this is what I've done with it. Matthew Flinders. Victorian Railways S-Class. I'm just trying to do this without knocking things on the floor. That's Victorian Railways. Victorian being Victoria, New South, um, Victoria here in Australia, which is just south of New South Wales. Come back into here. You sort of see here the joins where I've actually kept the part of the original cab and added in side valances. All this tender is scratch built. The whole loco is kit bashed. But all this tender was built on that squaring board you just saw. And with all my projects, when I'm doing steam, I always use real coal in the tender. So if I can get this to behave itself and do what I wanted it to do, there you go. So 
So there's all the, the coal, which is real locomotive coal, crushed down. And all the bits inside. Now this squaring board was bloody handy for this because I've got everything squared. So as far as the back, you can see the recess in this is right down low. The sides of the tender are curled. All this top deck, as I call it, where the water hatch and toolbox sits. All through to the divider between the coal and the, the rest of it. All that was built on the squaring jig. And then the tender sides and back is all brass. So I've got the curl. Using a sheet of brass I was able to curl that around and get it mostly right. But all that tender was built on the squaring board. So that has been a bloody good tool for many locomotives, including this one. So there's, there's a lot to be said about different things. Now if I take this out, you actually see the front of this loco. Victorian Railways. Now this is how the S-Classes were originally built. They went through modifications through the years. And... Um, at some stage they were converted to oil burners and eventually put back to coal burners. But out of the four locos that were produced, S300, class leader, which is this one, Matthew Flinders, S301, 302, 303. Four of them only built. Triple cylinder engines, so they had a cylinder down, down the guts of everything. And certainly with that, as a express passenger locomotive, they held the record run from Melbourne to New South Wales, as far as the borderline. That's just one of a few projects that I've got here. I'll put that back into its box in a moment. And another project I'm about to show you, also be done on the squaring board. DJH kit. Right. It's a French 210. All that will be assembled, certainly the tender will be assembled on my squaring jig. So that's what I'm about to start working on very soon. So um, it does for the Swedish National, Eastern Region and Nord. So if you want to get a hold of one of these brass kits, they're brass and white metal, very weighty, a lot of traction. Most of them have been a joy to build. So when it comes time to building this one, it'll also be done on the squaring jig, or on the squaring board that is. So I'll just move this class out of the way. Give a quick sticky beak into here because this like I'm building for somebody. Just to give you an idea what's involved. Wrapped up in there will be the boiler and smoke box and all the rest of it. Wrapped up in there will be parts of the tender. Then down inside here all sorts of bits and pieces wrapped up in there. Got down here the wheels, the axles, the bearings, the nuts and bolts. A whole myriad of bits and pieces. So I won't go pulling it all out. Not at the moment anyway. Down here you've got cylinders. The floor of the tender. And then underneath all that there's a stack more bits and pieces. Including all the hitch brass work. So... To save a bit of uh, YouTube time, I'm going to uh, put all this bit away and just illustrate that out of many things as a modeler, that's something you might want to consider making. And th these nails, basically they're, um, I think it's a 564th drill bit, and the nails are roughly 1.9 mil diameter, so. With a, with a that's 1.9 mil metric or 1164 oh sorry 564 whatever yeah I won't bother taking this off at the moment it's a bit of a tight fit but generally that's about the size nail you're looking at so if you've got nails a bit bigger well that's up to yourself but for a, you know a job that takes about 10 15 maybe 20 minutes to build then great gotta go catch you later